The January 6th committee lawyer, the counsel who was there facilitating a bunch of the interviews and all the things that made Liz Cheney very happy, was brought into trial in Colorado on day five. And he gets a little bit squirmy here during one part of the cross-examination when they put up on the screen Raskin and Aguilar and other J6 committee members who were supposed to be fair and unbiased and impartial. But when he saw their statements and was asked about their impartiality, didn't feel too comfortable sitting there for a while. And so we're going to go through that. The guy's name is Tim Heafy, and we've got a decent sized clip from him with four different examples that he gets walked through. But first, let's talk about what happened earlier in the day. There was a long exchange involving this guy, St. Thomas of Law professor. His name is Robert De La Hunty. And in day five, we listened to a lot of him because he is the opposite of the other expert that we saw earlier in the trial earlier in the week. And they brought out the guy, I think he was from Star Trek, and he was explaining how the 14th Amendment absolutely applies applies to Trump and that all of the language in the 14th Amendment applies exactly to what Donald Trump did and how Trump's statements and how his failures to act and how all of these things were justifications for invoking the Insurrection Act under the 14th Amendment and throwing Trump off of the ballot in Colorado. So this guy's coming out to explain the opposite position and his name is Robert De La Hunty. And let's listen to how the testimony unfolded in trial on day five. And again, the audio is a little bit wonky on this one, so we'll modulate as best we can here. Let me ask you this. Professor Megliak also testified that the shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion language means any voluntary act in furtherance of an insurrection against the Constitution, including words of incitement. And he based this on judicial decisions and a U.S. Attorney General opinion of Attorney General Stansbury. What's your opinion on that? Okay, so the Star Trek guy came out and he said that insurrection, as defined under the 14th Amendment, also includes words of incitement. So that means that words of of incitement, they're going to say is Trump's words of fight like hell. Does that fall within the 14th Amendment? Do you agree with that guy from outer space? Stands on the use of Stansbury's opinion in defining what insurrection is. I, I would have three thoughts, I guess, about that part of Professor Michael's testimony and report. First of all, I would say it's a linguistic point. I think engage in insurrection has a more restricted meaning than he supposes. Narrower, less applicable. Speakers of English language, I think, would think this. If we use a phrase like engaging hostilities, we probably have in mind combat, not the preparatory actions that would go with engaging in hostilities. I think intuitively we would distinguish engaging in hostilities from engaging in incitement, let's say, to hostilities. So that's just a linguistic. Point. Incitement versus insurrection versus hostilities. What is engagement? What is insurrection relative to these other terms? But the and if you're at home playing the drinking game every time either the witness or the defense attorney say the word um, be careful. Back up to the Constitution's section three's use engaging in insurrection. The part of it is the second confiscation act which I think Professor Magnet decides, which itself distinguishes between various preparatory or accompaniments of engaging in insurrection or rebellion and engaging itself as the language of the Second Confiscation Act. And so it, the act distinguishes between, let's say, inciting an insurrection or rebellion versus engaging. Congress had that template before it and cut out or at least didn't include all this other language and in section three it narrows it to engaging Okay, so the language that actually showed up in the 14th Amendment is pretty narrow, right? It says engaging in an insurrection, very narrow. When they were drafting the Constitution, they, or that 14th Amendment in particular, after the Civil War as part of the great, the Reconstruction Amendments, they had a bunch of other stuff in the first draft. You know, you send documents back and forth, delete that sentence, change that word, remove that, put that in there, add this, all those things, red lines. The original version had all the other things, okay? Engaged in hostilities or organized or planned or sent letters or passed notes between the judge and the clerk in interprofessional interchanging relationships or whatever it is, right? All of this stuff could have been part of the law, but it wasn't. They said engage in insurrection. And so this gentleman is going to bring us some more analysis and explain why the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to Trump and what they're trying to do, which is remove him from the ballot in a second, right after a quick message from our friends. And we're back with this scholar explaining why the insurrection amendment, the 14th 
14th Amendment doesn't apply because it's much narrower. It's not as broad as originally thought. The insurrection or rebellion, which I think very strongly suggests that it was not covering the same class of activities as the second confiscation. So engaging in insurrection in Section 3 has a narrower meaning than the comprehensive sweeping account of, well, of the activities associated with insurrection or rebellion that you see listed anywhere in the second confiscation. I agree with Professor Magliocca that Attorney General Stanbury's two interpretations of statutes, the issue of the, in the uh, Military Reconstruction Act of 1867, I agree with him that the Attorney General's opinions are certainly good evidence as to the meaning of engaging in insurrection in Section 3. They were opinions that were written while Section 3 was being debated and in the process of ratification. And he actually, Sam, Sam Ray actually has a section in the first of his opinions dealing with the statutory language of what it means to engage in insurrection. So that's contemporaneous. It's from five officer of the executive branch. It is about a statute, but it sheds light on what engaging in insurrection means for Section 3 purposes. And looking at the Stansbury opinions, what's your view on how he defined insurrection and its application to Article Amendment 14, Section 3? So I think Professor Magliocca underdescribes what Attorney General Stansbury is writing about. When in the first of these two opinions on the Military Reconstruction Act, in the first of them, Stansbury has a section called something like engaging insurrection to the better. Engaging. Well, I think it's actually called engaging. It's about engaging in rebellion or insurrection. So Stanbury says, okay, this is what he's going to explicate. It's like actually the statute. And he starts by saying that engaging in there has to, you have to distinguish between active and passive engagement, participation in rebellion. Stanbury is here primarily addressing what it means to engage in rebellion, not insurrection. So you okay, then the difference between insurrection and rebellion, and you know, all this is called statutory history. It's what was the history leading up to the statute and the debates and all of the you know committee reports and all the stuff, like everything Congress looks to. What did they review? What kind of data went into this and all the things? And they define the difference. You know, what's a rebellion? What's an insurrection? What is passive involvement in the insurrection versus active involvement? Can you be passively involved in an insurrection? Here's what he says. You have to start Stanford says by distinguishing between active and passive participation. And passive participation in rebellion doesn't count under the statute. So that's his first sort of distinction. All right, so we're just discussing the different words and the different statutes or the different conversations, the different debates that were taking place while the 14th Amendment was being crafted. And the question becomes, was it something that would apply to a riot at the Capitol building such that Trump should be considered to have become an insurrectionist and be disqualified? You probably saw this story about Chicago BLM supporting the attack on Israel with a very provocative ex post. The title, Fury as Black. Black Lives Matter group posts image of paratrooper and says it stands with Palestine. A lot of people on the right were talking about this story, obviously, but on the left, total silence. When we look at the story over on Ground News, the sponsor of this video, we can see that there are currently more than 20 stories published about this and over 90% of them were from the right. That makes sense. The right is indulging in the left's hypocrisy while the left is trying to ignore it. We can also see every article published on this topic in one place and compare each headline to see how the media is framing the story. What's nice about the Ground News app and their website is that it aggregates all the news sources from local and international sources on any given story and it shows us who is saying what and it even provides background information on the news sources themselves like who owns them and it gives us their factuality rating and their political leanings as well. But what I love most about Ground News is their blind spot feature and maybe even 
even more importantly, shows the stories that the right might be missing or even hiding themselves. Stuff that we don't want to ignore and that we need to cover here. We have our opinions on this channel, of course, but we try to make sure that we know what the other side is doing because that's how we make our arguments stronger. Ground News helps with exactly that, which is why I think what they're doing is more important than ever. So check it out for yourself. Go to ground.news slash RGE. I really believe what they're doing is important, so check it out. The link is down in the description below. Now, we get to this exchange. Now, this one is pretty interesting. So this guy's name is Tim Heafy, and the removal team, they brought him in to talk about how the January 6th committee was done so appropriately above board. He's got some background. They did this credential drop with this guy that, you know, very, yeah, I worked here, worked here, worked here. And they used him to kind of uh, rebut Cash Patel's testimony that we released all the transcripts and everything was above board. Okay, we give everybody everything. We didn't hide or miss any evidence, which we know is totally untrue because they're demanding that evidence in other trials. Trump's team is doing the same as we know it was essentially deleted when it was on loan before it landed at the House Administration Committee. We've had Congress people investigate it. But this guy is now on cross-examination. Okay, so they brought him out. They played their little show and now they're bringing him out and we're going to watch him squirm. And you can tell me if you think he's squirming or not in this next six minutes, but certainly looks like it to me. Now, what we're going to see here is I think four different exhibits, one after another, and they're just going to put them up on the screen and they're going to say, hey, Mr. Heafy, now you're, you're a lawyer. You've worked on other cases like this. You know what it's like to be fair and impartial. And we wanted the January 6th committee to be fair and impartial. We unfortunately didn't get the Republicans on the committee that the Republicans wanted. So Liz Cheney and Nancy Pelosi, they just picked two Republicans who are not even Republicans anymore, Liz and Kinzinger. And the minority party, the Republicans, they couldn't get Jim Jordan on there or anybody else. And so they just conducted this in violation of HR 503, their own house rules. And they said it was all fair and above board, even though there was no adversarial proceedings or counter witnesses or even opening statements by the other side. So then they did this. They said, okay, since you're the lawyer and you managed a bunch of this, can you tell us whether you think that the committee and their work product was in fact fair and impartial, given the fact that they made all of these statements right after January 6th before any evidence even came in, right? This is Adam Schiff's statement on January 8th, 2021, after January 6th. So there was not even an opportunity to see any evidence. And boom, Adam Schiff, who was on the committee, the fair and impartial committee, this is what he was saying. And we're going to listen to this counsel for the J6 committee sitting and squirming in his chair. So it says, while we were performing our duties, the president of the United States in an unconscionable act of sedition and insurrection incited a violent mob to attack the Capitol. In your view, is that as consistent with someone being fair and impartial in an investigation? I think that was Mr. Schiff's hypothesis informed by events that he observed but does not reflect him or others to have the Okay, well, let's go to exhibit 1095, please. Saw those hands? Ah, another committee member, Aguilar. One moment, Mr. Hafey. It says, towards the end of the first paragraph, it says, Aguilar spoke on the House floor to call on his Republican colleagues to uphold their oaths of office by holding the president accountable and supporting impeachment. So here's where Representative Aguilar is asking others to hold the president accountable and support impeachment. And then later in the next paragraph it says when the president sent a mob to the Capitol radicalized by his lies about the result of a free and fair election to stop the counting the electoral votes he made it clear that he poses a grave threat to our democracy in your view that statement is also consistent with representative Aguilar being fair and impartial in the investigation in January 6th yeah the reference to impeachment is instructed that there was a proceeding in Congress seeking to impeach the president based on 10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -10 -
Okay. And here she says the president incited a violent insurrection against our democracy, proof he's unable to uphold the Constitution. Is that statement consistent with her being fair and impartial in this investigation? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Well, let's go to Exhibit 1099, please. Perfectly fair, perfectly unbiased, totally impartial. January 25th, no evidence was even gathered yet. Raskin, Jamie Raskin, the guy who School objected files. in 2016 to Trump. Okay. So this says that the nine impeachment managers will present is the second to the last paragraph. The nine impeachment managers appointed by the House of Representatives will present overwhelming evidence of the facts of former President Trump's incitement of the violent insurrection that took place in and around the Capitol on January 6, 2021. Is that statement consistent with Representative Raskin's ability to be fair and impartial as a member of the committee? Yes, that's the impeachment Okay, so even though he said there was overwhelming evidence, and even though he said there was overwhelming evidence that President Trump had incited a violent insurrection, and even though he actually led the prosecution of President Trump, you're saying that he remained fair and impartial in determining the conclusion and in investigating and coming up with conclusions on the January 6th Select Committee. Is that correct? Yes, because the goal of the January 6th Committee was not about the culpability of any one person. It was about sure. the overall <laughs> facts and circumstances that informed the attack. Oh. All of the various components of the <laughs> the president's incitement of violent insurrection was one among hundreds of facts and circumstances yeah, yeah, that were yeah, considered. Yeah. And even that, if there had been contrary evidence, we would have presented that. So I don't believe any of these statements about this one fact or maybe represent that, that any of our members were, to use your term, closed minded. The no, they were not totally open-minded, okay? Not closed-minded at all. And so he felt a little squirmy to me. You'll have to tell me what you think about that. But certainly looked a little uncomfortable when he had to defend those statements. Why? Because they're indefensible statements. It was obviously a political attack job. And now he's got to sit there as a lawyer and say, no, 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 no. They could set all that aside and be fair and impartial. It was a bunch of people on a mission to take out their political opponents, which is why I think they set the whole thing up to begin with. And we see now... Now he gets cross-examined during day five of the Colorado trial. We'll be back next week for another week of this. And I do hope you join us and subscribe so that you don't miss anything that we're doing here. And we'd love it if you checked out our website, robertgovea.com. The link is down in the description where you can sign up for our daily newsletter, get all of the various segments that we cover here delivered to your inbox, where you can download the links, read the reports on what the video covers. And we'll be looking forward to seeing you there on the next one.